Well, let's, um, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and we will get into our message for today. Okay. Lord, thank you for today as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, as we celebrate uh, Jesus, and the price that he paid, but also the, the joy of the resurrection. Because of that, we can look forward to resurrection. Because of that, there is hope for us. And, and God, I pray that you help us to see that. And, and as we get into our message today, God, help us to see that, that not everyone sees uh, Jesus' resurrection the way we do. But God, help us to be witnesses. Help us to share that good news. And then, God, help us to to be um, your examples as we live out that resurrection life day by day in the world around us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I will tell you, um, this year for Easter, I really struggled with what to preach. And I know that sounds odd, right? Because it's Resurrection Sunday, I should preach Easter. But here's the problem, right? As I'm preaching right now through the book of Ezra, and... Um, my plan originally was to take about a, probably a two or three week break in Ezra and preach some Holy Week, you know, uh, Palm Sunday and Easter and that kind of stuff, two to three Sundays worth of that, and then get back to Ezra. But then um, I, I got the surgery scheduled and I wanted to finish up Ezra because I knew I was going to be taking a little break, you know, when I had surgery. So I wanted to finish up Ezra and not leave that with somebody else. I'm like, or leave it for weeks and weeks to pick up later. And so, so then the timing was absolutely perfect for the way I had outlined the book of Ezra to just preach right through Easter. I mean, you'll notice last week for Palm Sunday, we didn't talk a lot about Palm Sunday. We continued on in Esther or in Ezra. And um, I'm being honest, that's what I was going to do today. We were going to celebrate Easter, we we're going to talk about Easter, and then we were going to get into the message in Ezra, <laughs> right? It was just the way it is. Um, but I just, uh, I've been reading uh, this little book that, um, that's not it. I didn't put the picture in, I guess. I downloaded it and didn't put it in. I, I was reading this book um, about, it's not in there. Uh, uh, it goes through the book of Acts. It's basically a 31-day devotional book. InterVarsity Press sent it to me. And um, so I'm checking that out. And, and I was reminded when I got to the section of this book in the section of Acts where Paul tells that there's this story that Luke recounts about Paul and that's what we're going to talk about today but then I was just really like you know what let's uh we're going to do that let's we're going to talk about the resurrection and so I've gone through and I've rearranged Ezra a little bit and we're still going to finish it in time and um but we'll we'll pick back up there next week um a little over 100 years ago, 120 years ago almost, December 17, 1903, Orville and Wilbur, Orville and Wilbur Wright. Now, this is not, it's a colorized picture. There weren't color photographs then. But, um, they, they succeeded finally in, in getting this homemade airplane they had built. Now, they were bicycle mechanics. And they had gotten this airplane. They finally got it off the ground at the beach in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And... Um, they, they got it off the ground. It flew. Does anybody know how long that, that first recorded flight was? How, not distance or time. You can take a guess. Anyone want to guess? It's a little better than that. It was 59 seconds, and it was 852 feet. So they got, it was less than 1,000 feet, but that's the first recorded powered flight you know, uh, of this kind. And so, so they, they rushed a tele, telegram from their North Carolina. They rushed and sent a telegram to their sister who was in Dayton, Ohio. And here's what the telegram said. It said, first sustained flight today, 59 seconds. Hope to be home by Christmas. Right? That was the telegram. Okay? And they were excited. So the sister, who's also excited, she goes to the local newspaper so she can report this news, right? And they can report it in the local paper in Dayton, Ohio. And the next morning, the headline of the paper read, Popular Local Bicycle Merchants to be Home for the Holidays. They missed 
the scoop of a lifetime. <laughs> like they miss the story. They miss a story. They miss the story just because he missed the point. Sometimes I think we miss the point because we lack the perspective of history. Like we miss the point sometimes. I, I, I would imagine that there are things that happen in our lives or that we witness or that we experience or that we are aware of that, you know, 100 years from now, would, somebody would look at those and say, did they not even notice this that was going on in the meantime? Like they were focused on this little unimportant thing that did not matter. And they missed all of this. And that's what happened to that newspaper editor. Now, from our perspective, there's no way you should miss that. It's 59 seconds, though. It's probably not a big deal to him. Changed the world, but he didn't recognize the significance of the event. But here we are 2,000 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And we, we live in a world that is so often just like that editor who viewed the Wright brothers' first flight. They just don't give a lot of thought to the real story. You know, we, you know, well, there's been a lot of eggs and bunny rabbits, and now all that is springtime, and that's great. Like, I'm not, I, I tease my wife about the bunny rabbits and eggs around the house, but I don't really care. Like, I don't care. But that's, like, we focus on the, the move from winter to spring as if that's the big story. And we focus on new clothes or, or taking a trip or a long weekend or whatever it is that we do around Easter as if that's the big story. And it's not. The most significant event in the history of the world is what we celebrate. It's what we commemorate. And yet the world goes on about life, and focuses on all these other things that really just aren't important. They just don't get it. So before we read our text for today, I want to set the stage a little bit because normally we preach through something and so you kind of have the context, but today we're plucking a passage out. And so I want to give you some context. So we're in the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts 25. Paul has made his missionary journeys. We're near the end of the book. Acts is 28 chapters. We're near the end of the book of Acts. Paul has been arrested. And he is in a Roman jail in the Praetorium in Caesarea. He, um, there is a new Roman governor who has been appointed. His name is Festus. And um, Festus uh, is making the rounds and he goes to see the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. And they inform him about this guy. You've got this guy locked up over there, Paul. And here's the horrible, horrible, like he's done these horrible things. He's the worst man ever. And, um, and so we, we want you to go ahead and execute him or at least bring him back here for trial. And, and what they wanted was they wanted him to bring him back to Jerusalem for trial. They really didn't intend to have him stand trial. They were going to most likely ambush that escort and kill him on the road. And if he made it back for trial, well, then we just have a kangaroo court. We find him guilty and we execute him here. Either way, they win. Paul loses. And, but, but Paul was a Roman citizen. And so he told Festus, he said, no, um, uh, they, they've accused me of crimes against Rome. I'm, I'm in a Roman jail. He said, I want to be tried by a Roman court. Paul kind of saw it as if, I, if you send me back to Jerusalem, that's sending it downward in the court system rather than upward. And I've already been down there. It's time to go up. And so he used his rights as a Roman citizen. He appealed directly to Caesar. And so they're making preparations to send him to Rome to stand before Caesar. Well, in the meantime, there's a, there's a king over the area. Now he's still under the authority of Rome, but there's a king over the area, and he comes to Caesarea to pay his respects to this new Roman governor. And so... Governance there is under an emperor is complicated. You want you leave some of the structures in place, you replace others, and they're all under the under the headship of the of the Caesar. And so, whatever positions a king, we think of a king as the ultimate ruler, but not there. He still answers to the other authorities. So, 
So let's pick up. We're in Acts chapter 25. We're going to begin in verse 13 and read through verse 22. And uh, it says this, A few days after King Agrippa, that's the local king, and Bernice. Bernice is his half-sister. And there's a whole lot of things that are not written but are pretty well known and fairly well documented in history that we're not going to get into in all of this because we're just not. Um, a few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. Now, here's why he did that. He understood that, that um, the king was a local. Like he understood. Festus was brought in from the outside. He didn't really understand the way this Jewish world worked. But Agrippa did. And so he went seeking some advice, some input from him. He said, there's a man here whom Felix, that was the previous governor, Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them, it's not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced their accusers and have had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Remember, they're telling him about this horrible man, Paul. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. And so uh, Festus is very confused. I was at a loss how to investigate such matters. So I asked if he'd be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. But when Paul made, but when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I'd like to hear this man myself. And he replied, tomorrow you'll hear him. And if you want to read the rest of that, you can go to Acts 25. So. There's a lot of stuff in here we could poke and dig and, and, and draw out of there. There's a lot of good stuff in here. But, but I want to talk about just one thing today, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. This text, in, in my view or in my understanding of it, it reveals two views of the resurrection. We know Paul's view. We know the church view but from so many other places. But this reveals that second view. And that's the view that the world around us has that doesn't understand the importance of the resurrection. This is it's the view Festus demonstrates. There's the world's view. There's the Christian view. Paul was under arrest in Caesarea. He's waiting to be taken to Rome. Festus hears Paul's defense before his accusers, before these Jewish leaders. And so... Um, Festus, though, when Paul exercised his right as a Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar, what this meant was that Festus had to hear the case because when he sends it up to Caesar, he has to send charges along. He can't just send a guy and say, hear his story and see if you can figure it out. Like, it's, it's a court case. And so he has to send along all the... So he needs to hear the case and send documentation about what this charge is. And all he can figure out is that they're accusing him of something about their own religion and there's something about a dead man named Jesus who Paul says isn't dead. I'm very confused. I, and so he, he doesn't really understand. He's got to figure out why this case is worth sending all the way up to Caesar. So Festus point, he, he ponders this. He, Agrippa and, and Bernice arrive and Agrippa's this expert in Jewish matters because he's a local. He, he He's the... Um, either the grandson or great-grandson of the Herod that was on the throne when Jesus was born, the Herod that ordered the death of all those infants in Bethlehem, right? This is the, I can't remember if it's the grandson or great-grandson of that Herod. That's Agrippa. And so there's a, they're, they've been for generations in this area, and they're, they're part Jewish a little bit, and so it's, they have an understanding of Jewish law and customs and people. And so he wants to get Festus' opinion. Verse 18 and 19, those are his summary of the case. It's two rulers, it's shop talk, it's inside baseball, so to speak. But, but it reveals to us the way the rest of the world views the resurrection of Jesus. 
we're also going to look at the Christian view that what Paul represents. And as we do, we're going to see that the world views the resurrection as this inconsequential, unimportant kind of footnote, while disciples of Jesus view it as the most important, not just story, but true story in all of human history. Everything hinges on the resurrection, everything. If there's no resurrection, Christmas doesn't matter. Paul says if there's no resurrection, nothing we do matters. And so to hear the attitude in Festus' words, or behind Festus' words, like again, try to hear, try to hear Festus in his own, I don't think Gunsmoke Festus, right? That's not, but try to hear Festus, try to hear his, his attitude or his thinking. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. It, it, let's just say this were in modern times, and you've got the local, every time two rulers get together, you've got a thousand reporters or, or whatever, right? And so just imagine you've got two rulers. You've got the governor of this Roman province, and you've got the king of the area, the civil leader. And, and, and they get together. If the news had been there, the important news probably would have been something like Festus and Agrippa meet, historic talks between leaders take place in Caesarea. It wouldn't have mentioned the resurrection. It would have been skipped altogether, even though that was the main thing they talked about. Because the world sees the resurrection of Jesus as no big deal. But to us, it's the biggest deal. It's the only deal. Festus probably thought Paul was going to be accused of murder or of plotting against the emperor or some really significant thing like that. Instead, it's a dispute about a dead man that Paul claimed was alive. And that's still generally the church's view, or the world's view of the resurrection. The church would make it front page news, especially on Easter. But um, to the rest of the world, it's, it's just a human interest story. In fact, at this time of the year, Easter is a big story in the news. But it's only because that's just kind of what people are doing. It's not because of the importance of the resurrection. It's not substantial news. It's, it's not news as if the president and some other world leader were visiting, or it's not big news like the scores of the Masters tournament this weekend going on, where we've got an Aggie in contention, apparently. It's not, like, that's news to them. Easter, there's an egg drop here, an egg hunt there, and a big service somewhere else, and the church sends in a rele news release that they're having six services this weekend. That's only news because the community's mildly interested. I get excited over the resurrection when there's so much other important news to cover. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, he argues that the entirety of the Christian faith is fully dependent on the bodily resurrection, the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus. Paul says if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So, so if there's no resurrection, even Christ hasn't been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, there's a lot of if then. If Christ hasn't been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. But more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him even if, in fact, the dead are not raised. And so we've made God a liar. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ hasn't been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Everything, everything, everything comes back to the resurrection. If you want to discredit Christianity, if you want to bury this thing once and for all, disprove the resurrection. It's the foundation, it's the domino that makes all the others fall when it's pushed. If there's no resurrection, there's nothing. And, and I would venture as, as churches or denominations become more and more, uh, the way we talk about it today is progressive, right? As they adopt a more, a more liberal stance, as they deny the literal death and resurrection of Jesus, that tends to be early days of their slide um, into history. 
the the, the uh, we were talking earlier about issues that local churches face and that we're all big churches face and small churches face and every denomination faces them but the fastest shrinking denominations in the US at least are what we would call the mainline denominations and those are the ones that have over the last number of years 50 to 100 years begun to deny those fundamentals of the faith like the virgin birth and the inspiration of scripture and the resurrection the literal bodily resurrection of the dead and i don't think those i don't think the slide in those denominations and the beliefs that they're adopting i don't think those are disconnected i think as a church as a church begins to deny the miraculous literal bodily resurrection of jesus there's really no hope why are we here if there's no resurrection Paul says if the resurrection is not historically true, we're all wasting our time to be a Christian. He says it's better to eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we could die. But the resurrection is not just a fact of history. It is the central fact of history. It is the thing that holds it all together. It's not some inconsequential event that can be ignored But here's the thing. It means that if he is the risen Lord, that he has a claim on your life. Because our hope of resurrection is based in his resurrection. And and if this is all there is, then this is all there is. This is pitiful. And that's the word Paul uses. We are to be most pitied. But... But since as followers of Jesus, we don't believe this is all there is, that there is more, there is a resurrection to come, all that hinges on Jesus' resurrection. Which means that if you're counting on his resurrection for your resurrection, he has claim on your life. It's a big deal. To the unbelieving world, the resurrection is not important. One of the key ways they um, emphasize this is to relegate it to the realm of private opinion. But the resurrection is a fact for the disciple of Jesus. It's a fact that confronts everyone. That it's not just a matter of, you know, I believe it, and it's my little private religious view, and so that's good enough, right? The resurrection of Jesus confronts us all. Festus said they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. But Festus had no idea how to investigate this. He's in effect saying it's the Jews' opinion against Paul's opinion. Everyone's free to believe what they want to believe about religion. And since there's no factual way of deciding which one is uh, between one and another, what am I going to do? And that's still the way the world views religion, is that it's a, it's a private, that's your truth. That's the thing, right? That we hear now about truth. You know, there always used to be the truth because truth is truth. But now it's about your truth and your truth and my truth. And your truth and my truth can be in opposition to one another and still somehow both be truth. What a logical fallacy. It's the resurrection is the linchpin to so much of this. There's only one truth. It's not a matter of you can believe what you want, want to believe and I'll believe what I want. And we don't change or try to change each other's minds that religion is a matter of private opinion. Jesus' resurrection, which provides for our redemption, which allows us to devotedly follow him, That should change every fiber of our being. There is no such thing as private Christianity. It's impossible. And so when we have leaders, when we have when we have leaders who say about fundamental truth, who say, well, this is what I believe, but you know, we're this is what's true for everyone else. That's not how this works, right? You either it's true or it's not true. That's why issues like the pro-life issue are so important, right? When you have when you have political leaders, decision makers who say, "No, I, I believe this, but I'm not going to 
I'm not going to put my belief onto somebody else. Well, no, if it's true, then help them come to your belief. Or else you don't have a lot of confidence in the truth. William Wilberforce was an outspoken Christian. He was in the English Parliament in the late 1700s. And one of his primary goals and the thing he's most well known for is his work, his desire, his striving for the abolition of slavery in the uh, British Empire. One of his fiercest, one of his fiercest op opponents was a guy, Lord Melbourne. And he was constantly complaining about Wilberforce's private religious views affecting Lord Melbourne's uh, personal life. So when Wilberforce wants to do away with slavery, that's going to affect Lord Melbourne, and he doesn't like that. That's still the view of the world. I don't want your religious views affecting my life. That's not how, that's not how it works. Other people are free to be religious as long as it doesn't confront me. But here's the reality is that the resurrection of Jesus, it confronts you. It absolutely confronts you. And it confronts me. It confronts everyone. When Paul was preaching in Athens, uh, and this is in Acts 17, he stated that in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, that's Jesus. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. You see what Paul did? He connects God raised Jesus from the dead. That's evidence that Jesus is who God said he is and that uh, everyone's going to be confronted with this. He's, they're going to be judged by him. He says that he, says he commands all people everywhere to repent. I don't know if you're aware of this. Here's a unique little word in the, in the New Testament. Um, typically, when you see the word all, here's what it means. This is highly technical, so hang on with me. It means all. That means that the resurrection of Jesus confronts everyone. We all have to deal with that. He didn't say, it's my opinion, if you care to accept it. He said, God commands everyone, everywhere, to repent. Because we're all going to stand before the risen Lord Jesus for judgment. It wasn't just Paul's private opinion. Jesus said in the Gospels that God the Father has entrusted all judgment to the Son. You have to accept the word of Jesus or you have to reject it. There's no middle ground. Like, there's not three options accept, reject, or decide later. There's accept or reject. By decide later, you have by default rejected. Anything that is not accept the word of Jesus is reject. Anything. He knew exactly what he was talking about, and you have to accept it. Either that or he was deluded, he was deliberately trying to, re to deceive, and you have to reject it. And to think that Jesus was trying to deceive us, or to think that he might be even a little mistaken on a few things. Jesus was talking about eternal life. Another difference in the way unbelieving world and Jesus' disciples view the resurrection is, is that the world simply sees it as not factual. It just didn't happen. But the disciples of Jesus believe that it's absolutely verifiable. Festus used a word for religion that could also be used for like superstition. Um, it, it's the implication that it's not easily verifiable. It's evil spirits and, and uh, not in the realm of fact or reason. That's the kind of word uh, Festus used for religion, about their own religion. And that's the world's view of Christianity, that it's mystical, it's spirit world, it's something, right? It's just a thing. It's a, can't really put your finger on it. It's seen as just one of the religions of the world, not any different than any of the other religions, that all religions are a matter of faith and not of reason or verifiable truth. Now, don't get me wrong. 
I think the resurrection is verifiable, and I think Christianity is verifiable as a, as a true belief. That being said, you can't apologetic someone, you can't convince someone into faith in Christ. You have to actually have faith. Like, you have to make that final leap. I have a friend who's really into apologetics. That's the defending of the faith and the answering objections and all that. If you've got somebody who has objections, like, you can answer all those objections logically. That doesn't mean that they have become a Christian. They still have to exercise faith. They still have to believe that. But I think you can verify those things logically. Um, it's clear that Paul didn't just think Jesus was alive. He was willing to die for this. He was willing to go all the way in trial to the emperor for this. He wasn't speculating. He wasn't hoping. He was presenting testimony as an eyewitness of the risen Jesus Christ. He, he had met him on the road to Damascus, and his life was turned around. It changed everything. He gave up everything when Jesus confronted him that day. It wasn't just Paul. The other apostles had witnessed the risen Christ, hundreds of others did as well. Uh, why else would not only the 12, but Paul and thousands and thousands of other early Christians, why would they live as, in the way they lived if they didn't believe, if they didn't know based on real testimony that Jesus was alive? There's clear, compelling evidence that it's a fact of history. Jesus, the Jesus who rose from the dead, he wasn't just a certain dead man, no different than other religious leaders. The last difference I'll point out is to the way the unbelieving world and Christians see Jesus' resurrection. The world doesn't see Jesus as a unique person. But as disciples, we, as his disciples, we know that he's the eternal son of God. And this is what it comes down to. If, we, if you accept that Jesus is the Son of God, it's much easier to accept that he was crucified and rose again, that he, was, that he experienced resurrection. Now, if you don't think he was the Son of God, then it makes sense that you don't believe he was resurrected. <laughs> Frankly, if you don't believe he was the Son of God, it doesn't matter that you don't believe he was resurrected, to be honest. Festus referred to him as a dead man named Jesus. In other words, he just saw him, he, he was just another Jewish religious leader. You know how in our culture we have sort of Messiah type figures who come up from time to time and they gain a little following and then they fade off the scene. Right? There was a guy just north of here in Waco a number of years ago that happened. And it happens around the country. It happens around the country and around the world where you have these figures who come up. This happened in the first century in the Jewish world. This was not uncommon. Jesus was not the first Jewish Messiah figure to come along. He was, however, the only one who they killed and, res and he raised from the dead. He's the only one who experienced resurrection. The world, by the way, still sees Jesus that way pretty much. The one description of Jesus that frustrates me above all others is when somebody will concede that he was a great moral teacher and, and, and a great religious leader, but was he the son of God? I don't, you know. But he was a great moral teacher, a great moral leader. And I'm like, you know, you can't, you can't do that. Either, either he's all of it or he's none of it. And C.S. Lewis um, does this, right? He, he fights this. He said in his book, Mere Christianity, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg. He's British, right? C.S. Lewis. Or else he would be the devil of hell. Like he, You can't say that you're a great moral teacher as a mere human. You can't say that you are... You can't make the claims that Jesus made about himself as a mere human and just be a great moral teacher. If you made the claims Jesus made about himself, they're either real or you're crazy or you're evil. This is all C.S. Lewis could come up with. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. 
Paul is about to stand trial, the entirety of his defense, everything rested on the resurrection of Jesus. It was the single event in human history that made it possible for Paul and made it possible for you and made it possible for me to be reconciled to God. The world around us that doesn't follow him will pass this off as a private belief that you can hold if you want to. They may see it as a fable or a fairy tale or a legend if they consider it at all. And they often see Jesus simply as a good man or as a moral teacher, but he is the Son of God. And he gave up his life. He gave it up for you. He gave it up for me. But he didn't just give up his life. God raised him from the dead on the third day. That's the most important story. To see the, re to see the resurrection of Jesus in any other way is a lot like focusing on the Wright brothers' trip home for the holidays instead of on their flight. It's to focus on the trivial and miss the most important fact, the most important truth in human history and the most important reality about who Jesus is. Will you bow your heads with me, please? We're going to close uh, the message in prayer, and then we're going to sing one more song. And um, if there's anything that God has spoken to you about, maybe something he's been dealing with you in the last few days, but if there's anything God's spoken to you about and you'd like to pray together or speak with me, I'd be glad to meet you at the back and there before you, and, and we can sit down and pray together and talk. But if Consider the resurrection. Even as followers of Jesus, it's easy for us to forget or to begin to place less importance, to begin to neglect the importance of it, the truth of it. Don't fall victim to that. It is the story. God, thank you. Thank you that you provide for us, that you provide truth, that you provide your Holy Spirit to live and work in our lives. But God, thank you that you provided your Son to come to live a sinless life, to die an unjust death, but God, to experience resurrection so that we can experience resurrection, so that we can be united with you, so that we can live with you here and in eternity. Help us, God. Help us to remember that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the story. It is the most important thing in all of human history. And help us to see that without it, as Paul says, we're of all men to be most pitied. In Jesus' name, amen.